Take your Bibles out if you have them, open up to Luke chapter 14, and there's a 10 insert in your bulletin today. Uh, the story, an old story about a guy coming down from the Carolina mountains. He was all dressed up, and, and in fact, he was, he was carrying his Bible. And a friend said to him, he said, Elias, what's happening? What's going on? Where are you going? And Elias said, man, I've been hearing a lot about New Orleans. I hear there's a lot of free-running liquor. There's a lot of gambling, a lot of real good, dirty shows. friend looked him over and said, but Elias, why are you carrying your Bible? Elias said, well, if it's as good as they say it is, I might stay over until Sunday. (laughs) There are a lot of superficial followers of Jesus today. A lot of people who are enthusiastic admirers of Jesus, but they don't really follow him. They're not fully devoted to him. There are so many in the church today, in, in America who profess to believe but don't perform, who claim to be his but don't carry out any of his desires, many who have heard what he said but have never heeded his words, many who have observed Jesus, they've watched him, but they've never obeyed him. A lot of fans, but very few followers. Jesus said it would be that way. He said, when the Son of Man comes, will he even find the faith upon the earth? And as we saw last week, Jesus, in his uncompromising honesty, sought to clearly and unmistakably explain once and for all to all these irresolute uh, multitudes, as well as to us, just what it means to be his disciple. Now, Mike opened this series uh, back in the end of December, looking at Luke chapter 14, verses 25 to 27, Several things that we must do if we really want to be a follower of Jesus. See, just because we say we are a disciple, no more makes us one than a a mouse being in the cookie jar makes him a cookie. Just being in church doesn't make you a Christian. And a lot of times there were people that were following Jesus like that. They were following him for all the wrong reasons. They were following him for what they could get. As they received healings, as they received... uh, Uh, special experiences, as they got uh, caught up in all the excitement of what he was doing, as they received bread and fish and, 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 you know, fed their bellies. And so every once in a while, Jesus would stop and he would preach. And he would preach sermons that actually caused people to leave. John, the sixth chapter is one of those great ones. This is one of those ones as well. In verse 26 of chapter 14, we learn that Jesus, to follow a Jesus means that there's a choice of loyalties. Remember, Mike spoke about this a few weeks ago. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. That's not feel-good religion. Those are the words of the Master. Christ says, I must have first place in your life, above your family, above your friends, and above yourself. You shall have no other gods before me. And that's what we're going to be talking about when we get into that series, Gods of War. All the different gods that we have in our culture. In our lives, those things that we go to when we're struggling. Those things that we go to when we're going through difficult times. Jesus says, I want to be your Lord. I want to be your Savior. I want to be your Deliverer. So there's a choice of loyalties in our culture today. Secondly, if we're going to follow Jesus, Mike showed us that there was a cross to be born. He says there in verse 27, And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. A lot of people just are not aware of what Jesus said about what it meant to follow him. In that day, if people worshipped together and were caught by the authorities, they would be put to death. That's not true in our day, and perhaps because we have such an easy time of it, 
We don't realize the seriousness of being Jesus' disciple. But if you risk being arrested or put to death for being here today, would you be here? Are you willing to take that cross, that symbol of death, and die to self, and die to sin, and die to the old way of life, die to the flesh, your own human desires, die to the world? That cross, which was an instrument of sacrifice... Are we willing to take up that cross and sacrifice in terms of time and talent and treasures for Jesus? And then in verse 28, Jesus tells us a story to remind us that before we even choose to follow him, there is a cost to be counted. So what I want to do is take up where Mike left off three weeks ago. Jesus wanted people to know ahead of time what they were in for if they chose to follow him. Very much unlike uh, those today who sugarcoat the gospel to make it palatable, palatable. Now truly, it pays more than it costs to follow Christ. There's no question about it. That whatever the cost would be to follow Jesus, it, it is worth the, the, the benevolence, the beneficence, what we receive from Him is far greater than any cost that we might pay. But here in Luke 14, to help these people who were following Him superficially, to really understand, Jesus wants to stress the cost so that they might know exactly what He stands for. And so He says, which one of you, when He wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if He has enough to complete it? Otherwise... Once he's laid the foundation, he's not able to finish it. Everybody who observes it begins to ridicule him, saying, This man began to build, and he was not able to finish. Or what king, when he sets, sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and take counsel whether he is strong enough with 10,000 to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other's still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. Now, the parable of the tower... Jesus is probably talking about a vineyard tower. See, that in that day, in very well-kept vineyards, large vineyards, they would build a tower to guard that vineyard from those who might strip it during the harvest time. And before a man would begin to build this tower, he should sit down, Jesus says, and think about what it's going to cost to build it to make sure that he has enough. Otherwise, he'll become a laughingstock. Now, Karen and I saw that in a small town in Missouri that we grew up in. One man decided to build the largest house in town. And uh, I I actually worked for him, so I I helped pour the footer and the foundation, about 100 feet by 70 feet. He got the walls up, the insulation board on, he got the roof on, he finished some of the inside, and he ran out of money. And for months, well, more than months, for years, that house sat unfinished. Oh, he and his family moved into it, but there was no brick or siding or trim. And he was the talk of the town. He finally declared bankruptcy and moved away. In the other parable, Jesus tells of this king who decides he's going to war, but he'd be a mighty foolish king if he didn't first count the cost to make sure that his troops and his artillery were going to be able to defeat the other king. Otherwise, he might find himself minus one kingdom, and that's happened many times in history. Jesus says a person who desires to follow him needs to see beforehand exactly what it means to follow Jesus. To be ready to make any sacrifices that may be required no matter what the cost to us. See, somebody has said Jesus doesn't expect us to follow him regardless of the evidence, but he does expect us to follow him regardless of the consequences. And it's worth it. But before we begin begin the Christian life, we should ask ourselves a few questions. Number one, am I willing to deny myself? Because the beginning of the Christian life, as we saw last week, is the end of self. Self Self-denial, that's the first condition of discipleship. Jesus said, if anyone wishes to come after me, follow me, let him deny himself. Remember last week? Take up his cross, follow me. Jesus didn't mean a temporary denial of self. He meant a total denial of self. He didn't mean a sacrifice of certain pleasures for a week or two. He meant the sacrifice of self. My own desires, my own pleasures. I think I've told you before about the chicken and pig uh, that were uh, looking at church marquee. Country church, and they happened to be strolling by, and here's this church marquee, and it says, Sunday, ham and egg breakfast. 
The chicken said, whoa, that sounds like a great idea. The pig said, that's easy for you to say. For you, it's only a contribution. For me, it's a real sacrifice. Total commitment. But you see, that's what Jesus wants of us. Maybe that'll help you remember. He wants the whole ham. He wants the whole enchilada. He doesn't want an egg or two. He doesn't want a, you know, a few dollars here and a few dollars there. He doesn't want a, a, you know, some service one day and, you know, doing our own thing. He wants us to sacrifice self. It means to no longer live to please and pacify self, but to serve and satisfy Christ. Paul said it this way, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live in the flesh, I now Uh, I I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so Paul told the Colossians, that's what they must do. He said, therefore, consider the members of your earthly body, your hands, your feet, your eyes, your, your mind. Consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, passion, impurity, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. And that's exactly what all of us must do if we sincerely seek to be be his disciple. And no death is easy. C.S. Lewis said, the Christian way is different. Christ says, give me all. I don't want so much of your time and so much of your money and so much of your work. I want you. I have not come to torment your natural self. I have come to kill it. No half measures are any good. I don't want to cut off a branch here and a branch there. I want the whole tree cut down, roots and all. I don't want to drill the tooth or crown it or cap it. I want to have it out. So hand over the whole natural self to me. All the desires you think innocent as well as those you think wicked. Give me the whole outfit and I will give you a new self. A new life instead. In fact, I will give you myself, my own will will become yours. That's what Jesus desires. To deny self in every moment and in every way, to say no to self and yes to Jesus. He's not interested in superficial followers. A second question we should ask, am I willing to abide by his teachings? True discipleship means continuing in the words of Christ. Here's another one of those statements of Jesus. He said, if you abide in my word. Abide. Not just pitch a tent. But that word abide meant to set up a permanent residence. If you abide in my word, my words abide in you. If you're living in my word and they're living in you, then you are truly my disciples. Sink your roots deep into his word. Why? Because that's the mind of Christ exposed to us. That's his heart open to us. It's a vital part of the cost that must be counted. It's as though Jesus is saying to his would-be followers, you say you want to follow me, but are you willing to do what I say? Are you willing to, to be guided solely and unquestionably By my teachings, instead of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, are you prepared to turn the other cheek or to go the second mile when somebody takes advantage of you? Will you love those who hate you? When when people persecute you, will you pray for them? Are you ready to exchange your earthly treasures for heavenly treasures? Are you willing to allow your yes to mean yes and do what you say? Will you be a person of integrity whose word is their bond? Are you willing to to spend time with me in prayer and and in my word in fellowship with me, seeking my direction, seeking my will for your life? Are you willing to forgive those who have wronged you? To only speak that which edifies people and glorifies God without reservations, without any strings attached? Are you really willing to put my kingdom first above every other thing in your life to make me God? And not your family, and not your job, and not your career, and not your pleasures. Those are some of the awesome questions that Christ asks of every one of us. And there are questions that really sift the multitudes. In John 6, when he asked those questions, it says droves and droves of people, thousands of them, turned away and no longer followed him. 
Are we who have accepted Jesus as our Lord willing, really willing to follow his teachings? Now, I know none of us are going to follow them perfectly. We're in the flesh and we're still going to sin. But that must be our goal. That must be our desire above everything else. It's to please this one who has given his life for us. Yet how many of those who declare themselves disciples are really not willing or not ready to follow Jesus? Nobody asks more of us than Jesus and nobody gives more to us than Jesus. Nobody gives, does more for our lives. And I think there are a lot of people who declare themselves disciples that are just not ready. I've heard the strangest things from the mouths of professing believers. For example, I'm a Christian, but... Now let me just say, whenever you hear that phrase, I'm a Christian, but, you know, whatever you hear after the but, it's not going to be good. I'm a Christian, but I refuse to give money to the church. I mean, I've got to pay my bills, take care of my obligations. I'm a Christian, but I don't think God really doesn't expect me, you know, expects me not to have sex with my girlfriend. I mean, we don't sleep around. It's a monogamous relationship. And come on, this is the 20th century. I am a Christian, but, you know, we're saved by grace. Which some people take to mean you can just play upon God's grace and do whatever you want. Yeah, we're saved by grace. Just read the rest of that scripture. Through faith, trust, submission to God. For good works. (laughs) Yeah, we're saved by grace. But that grace, that love, motivates us to give everything we have for the one that gave all for us. We don't play upon His grace We enjoy His grace. We take advantage of His grace, but we don't take it for granted. The question is, are we going to follow Christ or not? Is Jesus really Lord of our lives? You see, we can't pick and choose which portions of this Scripture that we're going to to follow. We are either disciples or we're rebels. Either we intend to follow Him fully or we're not following Him at all. If He is Lord, then He is Lord and not us. First step in recovery, I realize I am not God. That I am powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing and my life is unmanageable. I am not God. He is. So I don't follow my own will in my own way. I follow His way. He is Lord. Everything he asks is in my best interest. Everything he wants me to do is going to be beneficent to me. Because he loves me and he knows me and knows what's best for me. See, if we just follow what feels good to us, then we're certainly not following him. We're following our own feelings, our own desires. So are we abiding by his teachings? Or are we picking and choosing our own? Third question, am I willing to follow him to the end? See, I think there are a lot of people who are willing to follow Jesus as long as the way is easy and comfortable uh, and doesn't demand much. But when the going gets hard and the road stretches long, they give it all up. The parable of the, the tower there presents that as a real possibility for all of us. In fact, that was why the very uh, book of Hebrews was written. Because there were people who were facing struggles, Christians facing opposition, facing ridicule, facing persecution from their culture, and they were being tempted to just jettison it all, give it up. There are a lot of Christians like the reckless builder. They start out with a spurt, but they never finish. They make the big mistake thinking that the Christian race is a dash. And God tells us it's a marathon. Many people, we had a baptism last night, we're going to have another one, the 1030 service. Many people see baptism as an end, rather than as the beginning of a new life. See, God is just like any of us who are fathers or mothers. He wants to see His children grow. He wants to see His children develop. He wants to see His children blossom. He wants to see them fruitful and successful. 
And he gives us the power to do that. Are you progressing on that road or have you turned back? You know what Jesus said? He warned us, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. So first we count the cost. Are we willing to pay the price? Then Jesus says there's got to be a casting off of possessions if we're truly going to be his disciples. It's another one of those phrases. I mean, are you aware of what Jesus said? So therefore, no one of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. What in the world does that mean? Well, it means that we are forever to settle the question of ownership. If we are to be Jesus' disciple, then all that we formerly considered our own, all the property and possessions that the state considers uh, to be entitled you know, to us, are turned over to Him. And we must live like that. It is His checking account. It is His house. It is His truck, His car, His boat, His savings, His investments, His children. And we are to use them and treat them as if they were His. We are managers. Jesus compared salvation to a pearl of great value one time. And this analogy of of finding this pearl, I think, helps us to really understand what it means to give up all our own possessions. So we find this pearl, this abundant life, this life of meaning, satisfaction, this promise of eternal life, of real life with God. And we say to God, I want that pearl. How much is it? God said, well, it's very expensive. Well, but, but how much? He said, well, it's a very large amount. Well, but God, do you think I could buy it? And he said, well, of course, everyone can buy it. But didn't you say it was very expensive? Yes. Well, how much is it? And he says, it's everything you have. So we think for a moment. But we see that pearl and we realize the value. We say, all right, I, I made up my mind. I want it. I buy it. So... He takes out his list. He said, okay, what do you have? I want to know. Let's write it down. Well, I've got $30,000 in savings. Good, $30,000. Write that down. What else? That's all I have. Nothing. You don't have anything more, God says? Well, i got a few dollars here in my pocket. He says, how much? So we start digging. Let's see, here's 30, 40, 60, 80, 100, 120, $120. So he writes that down. That's fine. He says, what else do you have? Well, nothing. That's all I've got. You know, God says, where do you live? He's still probing. I live in my house. Oh, yeah, I have a house. Well, the house too then. The house becomes mine. He writes that down. You mean I'll have to live in my camper? Oh, you have a camper? (laughs) He gets that down, you know. That too. What else? I'll have to sleep in my car. God says, you didn't mention you had a car. (laughs) Yeah, I have two of them. Okay, both cars. Both become mine. What else do you have? (laughs) And you say, well, you already have my money, my house, my camper, my cars. What more do you want? God said, I told you, it's everything. Everything, all you have. Are you all alone in this world? No, I've got a wife and and 2.5 children. (laughs) Oh, yes, your wife. And your children too. They become mine. What else? I have nothing left. I'm all alone now. And suddenly he exclaims, Oh, I almost forgot. You yourself too. Everything becomes mine. Everything you own, everything you possess, your wife, your children, your house, your money, your cars, your camper, and you too. And then he goes on. He said, now listen, I'm going to allow you to use all these things for the time being. But don't forget that they're mine, just as you are. And whenever I need any of them, you must give them up. Because now I am the owner. You're my manager. That's how it is when you're under the ownership, the lordship of Jesus Christ. And if you don't do that, you cannot be his disciple. You can't be a Christian. Wow. Do we take him seriously? Does it seem like too great a sacrifice to give up our possessions? 
He says, I've given you all these things. This is in, in the Bible. I've given you all these things to enjoy. He wants us to enjoy them. But we're managers, not owners. And Paul reminds us to consider what Jesus did for us. His grace. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. That you, through his poverty, might become rich. Christ's love and grace. His sacrifice is the only motivation for anything that we do in this life. And that sacrifice motivates us to make any sacrifice, to make any commitment, whatever's necessary to belong to him who loves us like that. So to be Christ's disciple, we count the cost. We're willing to pay the price. We renounce all our possessions. And then we embark on a career of faithfulness. Look at verse 34. Therefore salt is good, but even if salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? It is useless. Either for the soil or for the manure pile, it is thrown out. First week of this series, Mike spoke about a choice of loyalties. Here Jesus is speaking about a lasting loyalty. He says that we are salt. We're the salt of the earth. But the salt has to last. Because if it loses its savor, there's nothing else can be done for it other than to throw it on the manure pile. The Christian life is a life that lasts. No holidays, no days off. The commitment to Christ is a commitment for time and for eternity. Jesus said it this way, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. He said, the person who has God's approval will live by faith, but if he turns back, I will not be pleased with him. When we committed our life to Jesus, we chose to surrender ourselves to him as his disciples. And that choice settled many choices that people make today. See, as Christians, we really have no choice if we're to be faithful. Many of you know that in the Bible... The relationship with Jesus is compared to being married. When I chose to give my life to Karen, that choice settled a lot of things. If she makes a debt, I don't have a choice of whether to pay it or not. If I find another woman attractive, I don't have a choice of whether to ask her out or not. When she and I have a disagreement between us, I don't have a choice of whether to resolve it or not. Motivated by love, I made my choice on May 26, 1973. And that choice settled many future decisions if I'm faithful to that choice. And when I, motivated purely by love, chose to follow Jesus, was united with him in baptism, and became one with him on August 28, 1972, that choice settled many future decisions, if I'm faithful. And if I'm not faithful, I'm not even fit for the manure pile. We know that Jesus is not pleased with those who aren't faithful. You wouldn't be pleased. I went to Vegas this week. You think if I got back from Vegas and told Karen, well, you know, prostitution is legal there, so I had a few flings, that she'd be all right with that? Absolutely not. Why? Because I am committed to her. I made that choice. And that choice settled many future decisions. Jesus said to those in Revelation who were in the visible church, who claimed to be his, but were refusing to repent. He said, I wish that you were hot or cold, but because you are lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Integrity is probably the highest value on Jesus' list. Yes, we're saved by grace. But we made a commitment to him. 
to be His holy bride, to grow, to draw nearer to Him. The goal of our life is to be committed to Him. I was always so impressed with James Garfield, President Garfield's commitment to Christ. You know, he was an outspoken disciple. He was fully devoted to the Lord. And the first week after his inauguration as President of the United States, a member of his cabinet called an important cabinet meeting for 10 o'clock on Sunday morning to handle a threatened national crisis. And Garfield sent back the note that I have a previous engagement and I will not be able to be there. That cabinet member demanded to know what in the world could be more important than a, than a, a national crisis for the United States. And the president said, I will be as frank as you are. My engagement is with the Lord to meet him in his house around his table at 10 o'clock tomorrow. And I will be there. That's the kind of sacrifice and commitment that God demands and deserves of his disciples. Five things in this Luke 14. The choice of loyalties. Are we willing to put him first above everything else? No other gods before him. Not family, not friends, not pleasure, not work. No other gods. A cross to be born. Willing to deny self, to veto ego, to sacrifice my own desires and pleasures. A cost to be counted. A willingness to follow him, to obey his words, to listen to him. A casting off of possessions, a willingness to renounce ownership of all I have that I might use it for his glory and for his honor. And a career of faithfulness. A willingness to follow him to the end. To be a person of integrity regardless of the cross. It doesn't cost, though. It pays to follow Jesus. When we realize who he is, the one who knows us through and through, who knows what we need and has promised to provide everything that we need for life and godliness, for satisfaction and fulfillment, for meaning and purpose, we just love him with all that we are. I don't know if you want to call it falling in love, but when we recognize that, we bow at his feet and we... Follow him as our Lord and our God because we know he leads us to everything we really want in this life. On the back of your connection card, there's some next steps. For those of you who are not believers, I would encourage you to make that next step. Give your life to Jesus. There's no better life that you can ever possibly find. Be buried with him in baptism. Be raised to that new life and live that new life a life of freedom and a life of victory. The second step, if you're already a believer, just make a commitment, a renewed commitment, to give your life to learning His will, to find out what you can do to be pleasing Him and honoring Him and growing closer to Him every day. And then that, the third, third step is commit to do all I can to grow in my relationship with Him. Reading the Bible, praying, getting into a life group, you know, attending the next 101 class in February, February 23rd, I think it is. Going through the Better Life series, those foundational classes that will help you uh, with dealing to, to grow in your relationship with Him. Fill that connection card out and, and uh, stick it in the slot in the wall uh, back in the back of the auditorium. Let's bow in prayer. Father, we just thank you that we could hear from your word today. In Jesus' name, amen.